Welcome to our next episode of the Poland 3D Dialogue Debate Discussion Series. Um, today I'm very honored to have with us um, the Ambassador of Hungary, the Permanent Representative of Hungary to the United Nations um, for, this, uh, for this week's episode. Ambassador, thank you for accepting our invitation, first of all, and welcome. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Frankly, it's very important uh, for me to talk to you because from the very first moment I started to work with the United Nations and it, the beginning was in 1998 when I started to work with UNESCO, which is a part of United Nations, you know, dealing with cultural diplomacy, science, education, communication. That time I was a filmmaker and I produced a film series for UNESCO about the responsibility of the scientists in the 21st century. And that time we didn't know really, you know, what kind of challenges we are going really to face in the 21st century exactly now during the pandemic. But what um, I have experienced um, uh, during these two decades, I've been uh, strongly related to the United Nations in different capacities, that people don't really know enough about the United Nations. And people don't really understand the work we do. So your organization is a very important one because as I see really the, the whole network of these organizations is, uh, is that you are building bridges between the United Nations, between the professionals working for the United Nations and between the people you know, who probably don't really understand or, or, or don't, don't have really the enough interest about our work. And um, I'm also part of the governing body of the Hungarian uh, sister or brother organization of yours. And I'm also very much looking forward to um, strengthening our relationships and also the same way uh, building more kind of a trust, understanding and interest. Uh, in the people towards the United Nations. So uh, I congratulate you and I think it's great that you are sort of broadening up this relationship towards the people in Poland who have got a kind of obviously interest in us, in the work of the United Nations, but probably they don't have enough personal experience or impact. And just recently, um, uh, we celebrated Hungary's entrance to the United Nations. Um, uh, it was exactly 65 years ago on Monday this week. And um, uh, on this occasion, I, I spoke about this bubble we live in because, you know, the UN is really a bubble. We, we have this amazing life, you know, we, we sometimes, I would say, even uh, use a language which should be translated. Uh, when I presented my accreditation to uh, His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon in 2015, I told him, Excellency, it's high time to translate what we do. So this is very important that we speak a lot about the work what we do, because it is a complex way of looking at things because it is all based on the collaboration of the whole world, which is itself a very um, difficult uh, way of work to understand. And uh, we don't really have enough understanding in the world. So we should go out from the bubble and uh, the communication is very important. That's why this network uh, of yours is, plays a very important role in it. Well, thank you very much for those words. We definitely try our best. The, the pandemic has sort of shifted the way we do things this year, but, but we, we, we do try to get our activities going. So thank you very much for your words. That definitely means a lot. You mentioned a lot of aspects there, um, UNESCO being one of them, and I will definitely want to touch upon that um, throughout our discussion. But I want to start us off with a really important issue that has, in a way, as a result of the pandemic, I feel at least, has lost its um, volume in terms of how much we actually talk about it, and that is gender equality. So I remember two or three years ago, gender equality and climate change were really the two issues that we would speak about. Now, naturally, obviously, the pandemic is the one challenge we, we talk about. But because of that, I want to get us started off with gender equality. At the UN, there are 
roughly speaking, 50 women um, ambassadors, women, female uh, permanent representatives, which if you look at the total number of 193 countries, that is nowhere near um, even half. Um, so with that in mind, where do you think we are with gender equality today? Also keeping in mind the, the, um, um, the new law uh, that was uh, introduced in Germany um, with the, 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 about the um, quotas on management boards, is that the right direction that we should be taking or do you see other solutions to finally break that, uh, that glass ceiling that has been talked about for years on end now? I would like to, uh, to approach this topic from two aspects. One, about the UN and uh, gender equality. Second, COVID and women. Uh, when I came here, uh, I was the 36th uh, woman PR, and uh, I immediately uh, set up the Circle of the Women Ambassadors Network, and many men colleagues asked me, oh, yeah, this is really discrimination, you know, why do you do that? I said, you know, when uh, you will be in minority, then you can set up a network as well, uh, but so far, it is um, already a critical number, you know, because we have a voice, we, we support each other. But uh, I mean, where are we from 193 uh, permanent representatives? Uh, so the network itself has um, really found the ways, first of all, how to meet, how to share knowledge, how to share perspectives and directions, how to support each other. And um, within the ambassadors around, uh, if I would say uh, uh, this year, uh, we got this beautiful number, we were 51. At the moment we are not 51 anymore because you know, uh, many ambassadors are coming and going. But I'm happy to see that uh, more and more member states are sending women PRs. Why is it important? It's because it's a symbol. I mean, to get uh, the, the job uh, becoming permanent representative at the United Nations means that you have influence, um, people listen to you, you become a role model. Uh, being a role model means you have a lot of responsibility, but you can show to other women and girls that it can be done. So it's of course on the government to decide to send a woman or a man ambassador. And I remember Mr. Ban Ki-moon uh, said, oh, I'm so happy to your government that the government, your government sent a woman. So obviously everyone feels that the ability, the knowledge, the talent, the approach, what women in diplomacy have is very important. We know about the whole world that sometimes women approach a topic from a different perspective. I always say that when men have a, a political debate, you know, they know where they want to go, and if they can't go that directly, war starts. <laughs> what we normally do, we know where we would like to go, and we are not, you know, shy away to go a little bit left and then right and find a way how to get there meaning probably the way we conduct um, uh, discussions and diplomatic relations are uh, result oriented, but we can easily get the way of consensus, of compromise, of, I would say, a real dialogue. When I came here six years ago, I sat at the Security Council for the first year just to listen and I realized that people are just talking and talking, but never react to each other. So dialogue, of course, in the Greek way, is that I talk, you talk, we listen to each other, we react to each other, and we are ready and we are open to even change our way of thinking if we can really convince each other. So women in diplomacy is a very hot topic, I would say today, actually, in the world of diplomacy. I'm doing a, right now a big project with Columbia University uh, 
uh, and uh, with the Institute of Advanced Studies in, uh, in Kursag in Hungary on this project, how women in diplomacy are using their talent and knowledge. Um, so one thing is that the ambassadors are supporting each other or pushing topics, because this is really, you know, how we prioritize the topics we are discussing. So if we are, if we are joining forces and talking about what, for example, COVID means for women, women who are much more vulnerable during this epidemic, uh, women uh, who lost many of them more jobs than men, women, as we know today, uh, human trafficking, modern day slavery has even become more and more uh, dramatic during COVID. Women, because we know that many women are in the front line, in the health workers, women because they have less safe jobs. For example, I just uh, would like to say that, for example, um, they have the so-called only informal, um, informal employment, uh, often unregistered. So for example, in uh, South Asia, over 80% of women in non-agriculture jobs are informal employment. In Sub-Saharan Africa, this figure is 74%. In Latin America and the Caribbean, 54%. These are just some examples to understand that they are vulnerable. And of course, we heard about the violence, the growing violence during COVID against women and girls uh, in the households. And so women ambassadors in the UN have got this responsibility to to raise these issues even stronger, I would say. I'm not saying that the men colleagues are not concerned or they are not doing that, but I think if we, if we join forces, we can do it even better. Plus, I've been always saying that if we are working for, uh, 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 for equal uh, approach and, and, and rights for women and men, we can't do it only women. We have to do it with men. It, you know, it, it doesn't get us anywhere if we are just talking, talking and, uh, and doing our activism. So what is very important that we have um, a very good international network. It's called the International Gender Champion Network. It was actually uh, started in Geneva uh, by Switzerland. By now it's an international network. And everyone who is part of the network, men and women, have got the responsibility and urge to work on this project. Also, we need to find the men colleagues who are coming with us in these programs. So in the United Nations, I'm very happy to say that this is very much in the front of our activities. It has been before the pandemic, but also especially during the pandemic. This is what we do. This is what the member states do. And I would really say that uh, all the member states put a very strong emphasis on the damaging effects of the pandemic against women and the most vulnerable. The other aspect I would like to talk about a little bit is the leadership, the role of women in leadership. First of all, uh, during Secretary General um, Antonio Guterres, you could see that there is now really a gender parity on the senior management, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic in the United Nations. We have a great uh, Deputy Secretary General, the very first one, who is a woman, Amina Mohammed, uh, from Nigeria. But really, all the uh, amongst the under secretary generals, assistant secretary generals, uh, directors, uh, fields office uh, chiefs, and so on, you can see the senior in the senior management we have gender uh, parity. But as uh, secretary general said, we would need a long, long time really to get to gender parity within the whole UN system. So one thing is the UN system, but the other thing is us, is the member states, what the member states are doing. But the UN should work as an example. 
So I always say if the UN can manage to show good example also to the member states that it can be done and there are a lot of talented women uh, in conflict prevention, in conflict re resolution, post-conflict re resolution, peacekeeping, um, uh, peace talks. I always say that it's important that the women lead the peace talks, okay? Not only sit at the table, but they really have the, 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 um, the possibility to lead these peace talks. So I wouldn't say that we lost this topic. On the contrary, I think that it's very much in the front um, uh, of our activities in the United Nations, both within the house, within uh, the system, and both uh, amongst all the topics uh, we concentrate on. And I would like to say that um, for women, you, you, you talked about the women ambassadors, for women who have got to a point like that or who have uh, been successfully uh, conducting their journey and they are in leading positions, and during COVID, we've seen that uh, women leaders of countries have shown probably more compassion, um, uh, used more psychology, uh, became uh, closer to the people. Uh, probably it helped them also to solve these problems. Uh, but what is very important that uh, we should never forget that this journey is not easy. So by the time a woman gets really into an important position, should never forget the difficulty of the journey. Uh, many people talk about famous women politicians who by the time they became famous and big politicians forgot about you know, their difficulties on the road. And that is why I say that it's very important women to work for women as well. Uh, we have a very strong mentor program here for young diplomats, which I've been involved. And also I am very vocal about uh, the importance that uh, women leaders should really, you know, uh, help and, um, and never forget about the young talents who are still on the road. Uh, so I think it's a very important topic. Also, I've been saying for many decades that, you know, every century has got a moral call. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, we know very well with Poland, when we had to fight against dictatorship, uh, communism, uh, uh, fascism, every century there are moral calls. And I think the the, the the very important moral call of the 21st century is to give the chance to women to choose. This is the important, because women can choose in any way. If they feel like happy and fulfilled, staying at home, raising children, being uh, great mothers, you know, that's fine, that's beautiful, but they have to have the chance to choose. And uh, of course, it's very often a question of the culture. As you know, I've been a great champion of the culture of peace, and in the culture of peace, this is a very important element as well. I think uh, that's that's very important. That that message there at the end, I think that is something that will definitely resonate. I think throughout our our discussion later on, and I think it's a great message to to clip, so to speak, on our on our um, chat this evening. And it's great to hear that indeed that the topic that, like you say, has not been lost, and and on the contrary, it's actually there on the agenda. Um, and I also found it very interesting what you said about dialogue, that it has to be responsive and that it needs to end in some sort of concrete action and not just, um, you know, heads sitting in the room talking, but that talk doesn't end in much uh, results. So that's, uh, that's very important as well. Um, I want to now move on to, indeed, UNESCO. So, I mean, you were the 36th, um, the president of the 36th um, General Conference. So I think there's no better person um, to ask. Um, and we've seen roughly two years ago, the, the US and Israel have actually left, they've, with, they've withdrawn from, uh, from UNESCO. And a couple of years later, a couple of years on, how would you position UNESCO today? How do you evaluate the role of this organization? Um, and and what, is your, what is your take on that in, in the general sense? 
Uh, I was elected very uh, honored by uh, unanimously, you know, by all the 193 member states in 2011. And early on, I had already uh, the full support by each country. So I was the one who led the discussion and the talks on Palestine to be admitted to the UNESCO. And so these talks have gone for a long time, of course, with the Arab League, with the Arab countries, with Palestine, Israel, United States, uh, European Union. And uh, we knew that it would be a big problem, a financial problem, because of the two bills in the United States, which would then force them to leave the, United, the UNESCO, because that, that's, these are really the bills. Uh, so the American ambassador at that time, David Killian, was very, very nervous because he knew that if it happens, they had to move out um, because of, of the legislation of their country. Uh, it was a historic moment, obviously, what uh, happened uh, in November 2011. I also took um, South Sudan at the same time, actually, to, the United Nation, uh, to, to UNESCO. And we have worked very hard for years uh, with the American uh, administration at that time, how we could solve this problem. Because the universality of UNESCO is necessary. Universality means that, you know, we have an organization in which United States, Israel are also part. Um, I think it will be now Again, a big question with the new U.S. administration, how they will be uh, continuing this uh, situation, how they will be able to solve this problem, if they would like to solve it or not. But I remember when, as I said, started to talk, uh, to work with UNESCO in 1998, there was a time when UK, US was not part. So, you know, it was not always that always everybody was part uh, of, of UNESCO. So it can happen, it can function, it can work. But I think we have to do everything in order to fulfill the whole concept of universality. And I really hope that it will be solved in the future because UNESCO is a very influential um, organization, body of uh, the United Nations, because it is there to build bridges between people, nations, continents, civilizations in long term. Cultural diplomacy, science diplomacy, um, education, international uh, collaborations, uh, these are issues which help people to build trust and which help people to understand each other. I always say that we have to use cultural diplomacy because it is at least a hope, a possibility not to misunderstand each other. The biggest problem in politics and in the diplomacy that people don't understand each other. They are talking about something and they don't really know what the words mean. So I am a great believer and a great supporter of the so-called soft power because we know very well the different ways uh, in diplomacy and politics, how countries, governments can influence other countries and governments. But in long terms, if you are talking about the people and the, the, the way of thinking, these a uh, soft way of diplomacy uh, uh, signalings are really in long term building bridges between the people. So UNESCO, uh, I hope, will be able to restore universality. I would really love to see that from the bottom of my heart. And I really would like to see uh, that the people in the world through these uh, diplomatic um, channels will build up a trust and better understanding. When I came here again, you know, this is the, you know, this is Security Council. This is about wars. This is peace and security. This is, you know, the hardcore diplomacy here. 
And I said, oh, how do you want to make peace with people whom you don't understand, whom you don't know? And the way that you build up this trust and understanding the channel, obviously, is cultural diplomacy. Um, so I think it's a very influential and, um, and important part of United Nations. And look, an organization which deals with science and science diplomacy can be more important, you know, than, than that. Today we see during uh, the pandemic, what have we faced? Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, and the importance of science. So uh, we have to uh, cherish this organization, but as in the whole UN system, we need the reforms, we need the modernization, but we know that the United Nations is like a big ship, you know, which moves very, very, very slowly. Why? Because the United Nations is us. So it, it, it sounds sometimes that, you know, the United Nations says that or the United Nations does that. No, no, no. This is us. This organization is us. If we agree on something, we can do that. If the member states, if the P5, if the, if the members of the Security Council will not agree, the Secretary General cannot do anything, cannot even send uh, peacekeeping forces into countries. So it, people have to understand again that what we do is the, is the way how the UN will be able to function. But how UNESCO and United Nations and different um, organizations of the UN will successfully work in the future is really based on the way that they can react um, to the challenges of our present situation. Indeed, the United Nations is much closer to us than, than many of us think and I think UNESCO being one of the main bodies does need to have a huge role to play in showing that to the average citizen of, of any country really that the UN is indeed us like you indeed mentioned and um, I'm looking at the clock I know you have a meeting to run to so I'll just jump to my very last question and it's very good you mentioned challenges because that's what I want to ask about um, uh, 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 as a last question probably not not a very easy question and um, but I wanted to ask you apart from climate change and apart from the pandemic which we know our major, major global challenges, so-called wicked problems, as uh, Rittle and Weber in 1973 described them. Um, what do you, going into 2021, what do you see as the biggest challenge that the UN, that the broader international community will have to face, keeping in mind the armed conflict that is going on, on around the world, keeping in mind the sometimes called identity crisis of the UN that we've heard um, of uh, before, keeping in mind gender equality that we mentioned at the beginning and many, many other social, socio-economic issues as well. What do you see as the main challenge that we'll have to face uh, in the coming Look, we, we know that the UN has got three important pillars. One is peace and security. The other one is development. And the third one is human rights. Actually, just today, this morning, we finished the third committee. Uh, we adopted uh, uh, the, uh, the resolutions, we heard the report, which I chaired in these very trying times. And for example, the third committee, which is dealing with human rights, uh, culture, social, uh, humanitarian efforts, is very important because it is about us. It is about the betterment of the lives of the human beings in the whole world. For everybody, it is very important. So uh, that is why I think it's difficult to understand the UN, because you can't say that peace and security is the most important. Of yeah. course, we know there is no development without peace. We know that. How can you really, exactly. How can you work on development if you don't have peace? On the other hand, if you don't have development, very often you find yourself in a critical situation, wars and so on. Exactly. So everything is interlinked. I think what is the most important uh, fact that everyone has to understand, this interlinkages, this interconnection, that we as human beings, we are interconnected. 
we as countries, we are interconnected. Again, take the COVID. We just know not one country could solve this problem on uh, her own because it just doesn't work. So I think the way of thinking uh, in the minds of the people have to really understand that we are interconnected. And uh, whatever in history, in development, um, in human rights, uh, in politics we are talking about, uh, we are talking about circles. Of course, first, everybody's identity is who he or she is coming from, is a national identity. What is my country? You know, what is my flag? That's why we have these beautiful flags in front of the UN. And, and we all have, you know, a heartbeat when we just enter. Exactly, you have your flag, I have my flag, and we both have the UN flag, which connects us again. Of course, between Poland and Hungary, we have a lot of amazing <laughs> connections. We don't have uh, time now to, to talk about that. But, um, but uh, w w it's very important to understand that in this work, what we do, we have to really protect the identities of the people. I always say that the first step for everybody is to understand where he or she is coming from. That is why it's so important that there is no misunderstanding in your brain, in your mind, who are you? And it can be solved only through education of your country at home. If you are safe, I would always say in your own body envelope, you know who you are, you know where you are coming from, what is the history of your country, your culture, you protect your language, you protect your identity. Then you are not afraid stepping out and being interested in the other people because what the chaos is caused is the uncertainties. When people don't really know who they are, they are afraid of the others. So that's why it's very important that everyone has got a strong base to build up this identity and then can step out and work together with other countries, other cultures, and other people. And the UN is a platform for that. The UN does not mean that you have to lose who you are, no. The UN means that I'm here, I am who I am, my country is this country, this is my history, my culture, you know, my dignity comes from my background, and I would like now to understand who you are and let's see how we can join forces. Let's see how we can work together. And I think, you know, I'm biased, but I think it starts with education. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I could, not, I could not agree more. I always say education is the start to development. And as we mentioned earlier, because of the interlinkages, the interdependence, there needs to be a starting point. And the, the fact that um, everything is so interdependent, like you mentioned, makes it so difficult to address and resolve because it's not a one-shot operation, so to speak. So we cannot just have one uh, size-fits-all um, solution. Ambassador, it was, a, it was a marvelous pleasure. I know you have to run to a meeting, so I don't want to keep you much longer. Thank you very much. I take much. a picture because, you know, we live in a Twitter world. It's very important. You are nobody in New York if you don't have a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's digital diplomacy. That was another question that I had, but uh, I think we all agree that uh, diplomacy has changed the way it works. This communication, year. communication, clear cut communication is very important. Probably we will talk again, probably after COVID, you will come to Hungary and our organizations can also work together I thank you uh, for the invitation and I wish a Merry Christmas and beautiful um, holidays, a healthy and happy new year uh, in Poland to everybody and long live our friendship. Thank you very much. All the very best and lots of health to you, your family and the entire team. All the very thank best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>